I've spoken many times throughout the world, nationally and internationally, and I must tell you this is the hardest of all possible drushes, presentations to talk about. It's a very difficult subject, and it will demand, in order to be accurate and precise, that we should have clarity, the usage of certain language that under normal circumstances we would not use. Indeed, the Rambam in Mer Nebuchim speaks clearly in the third parak. Why is it that Lashon HaKodesh is called Lashon HaKodesh? And the Rambam suggests because there is no language for private parts of a person, not a man or a woman, in Lashon HaKodesh. And he tells us that if we have to talk about it, Kishyava Hatzarch Lezacham, I will do my best. There is a time when we have to be mature, we have to be open, we have to be clear. We are protecting children's lives. It is literally Hatzalus Nefashis. The Gemara. And Psachim clears the Shaila about Lasha Maguna, what Lashonis we can use and can't use, and brings a Raya Kiyadua from Nayach by the Teva that it says when he brought the Bahamas into the Teva, he brought Bahamas to Hairas and Bahamas Sha'enan to Hairas. Didn't say Lashon Tomei, didn't say Lashon Bahamas Tomeus, which is a Katsal de Kalashon. And in the back by the riff, go take a look. You'll see the Bala Ma'or brings in the Ma'or cotton a Dava Nifla and a Dava Choshev to this Maimed. And Zog the Bala Ma'or, this is his Lashen. The question again is why he doesn't, why the Torah doesn't say Tame, a Lashen Kotzer, and says Lashen Behem Shein Tamaris, Tahiris, and yet elsewhere in the Torah, we find in Shmini, for example, it says Tame. By Shratzim, by Meichalas Asuras, Tomeu, Tomeu, Tomeu. Zog the Balamor. The Tommy de Kosa Bereisa, Enu Losha Maguna, Lefisha Sorich Hakos of Loima, La has here as his roll, Ula Frisha Mikol Tuma. La has here as his roll, La Frisha Mikol Tuma. Rabbi say, This is what we're doing tonight. If I use language that anyone finds offensive, if I speak an Indian out that someone found offensive, do me a taiva, rather than walk out and grumble, please tell me. Contact me, contact the organizers, tell us how it could have been said better. But understand that this is la frisha minatuma, this is the ace atzarich, and you'll forgive me if I offend. There are many ideas as we walk through. I've given you a handout, and I want to walk you through the handout so that we understand Kaburian clearly all the Inyanim. And some of the Inyanim will be repeated again here and there. I'd rather be safe than sorry. Let's see if we can define what are we going to be discussing tonight. What's the sugya? What's the subject of sexual abuse? Child sexual abuse, there's three comments I've made here I'd like to ex examine and, and explain. Child sexual abuse generally refers to a form of child abuse in which a child is abused primarily for the sexual gratification of an adult or older adolescent. People ask me, Kaseda u Kaseda, what happens with little children, three-year-olds who play together and they, one exposes their private parts to the other one and they giggle and they run away. Is that child abuse? Are you saying that's abusive? No, I'm not saying that's abusive. But what I am saying is when one of the people involved has a need, a sexual need, is pleasuring themselves somehow, enacting a sexual behavior somehow, playing with another child, then that's not play, Rabbi say. 
and the results of that can lead to sexual abuse, and we will discuss this shortly, what that exactly means. Child sexual abuse can occur th through both direct and indirect sexual contact between the abuser and the victim. Talking, an older person, an older teenager or adult, talking suggestively in a way where the younger person, the child, the boy or the girl, is aware that the, the innuendo is of a sexual fashion, where they're interested in them in such a fashion, where they're looking at them in such a fashion, where it clearly indicates they have some sort of sexual interest in them, can create all the features and trauma of sexual abuse. It can happen without touching. Traditionally, we were always done on the shaila of, so who touched whom and where or what? Was it outside the clothing, inside the clothing? It can even happen, Rabbi say, without touching. It can happen by implication. It can happen by innuendo. Child sexual abuse can even occur through the child being accidentally exposed to sexually explicit material. I've seen children who have ended up with the full trauma of sexual abuse. Innocent children simply walking down the street and discovering an inappropriate magazine of pornography, picking it up, putting it in their bag, and reading that magazine later on and ended up with the full gamut of symptoms that are typical in child trauma of sexual abuse. We have to expand our awareness. We tend to think, unfortunately, of sexual abuse as some horrendous act like rape or something with a knife point. And so therefore our minds are not collect We're not looking for or understanding how this occurs, to whom this occurs, where this occurs. And that's why our children are not so protected. Even simple exposure to inappropriate material can cause the trauma reaction of sexual abuse that we will explain shortly what exactly that is, how it destroys, partially destroys a child's life. I've given a list here of types of sexual abuse so that we can understand again, Rav the Milsa, what are we talking about here? This occurs when an adult or any other pet person who possesses or whom the victim perceives as possessing a power or control over them does any of the following. These people who have this power could be anyone. It could be a parent, a Rebbe, a teacher, an adult, any adult, any young uncle. It could be any, another child. Even a child of, of a similar age who themselves unfortunately have already been traumatized. That child's interest in the other child is of a sexual nature causes sexual abuse. So when we're thinking, we have to abandon from our minds the notion of some, you know, uh, uh, some dirty old man who's abusing our kids lurking in the park. It is in our homes, it is in our shores, it's in our Bati Midrashim. It's happening to us in our lives. So I ask and appeal, expand your awareness as we move through this evening. And try to embrace, if you can, because what we're doing tonight is Hatzalus Nefashas. It's Pashat, simply Hatzalus Nefashas. The types of sexual abuse. Any physical sexual interaction with a child. That means if a child experiences someone else being interested in their private parts for the gratification of the other person, then sexual abuse has occurred. Any sexual kissing, fondling, exposure of either of their genitalia, exposing a child to pornography, just seeing a magazine, seeing a picture inappropriately, being shown a picture, kal v'chaimah. Saying sexually suggestive statements towards a child. The use of a position of trust to compel otherwise unwanted sexual activity without physical force, implying talking, explaining. I've heard awful stories in the course of my career of the implication of someone in a position of power or control who giving a kiss, giving a touch inappropriately, a hug inappropriately, where the younger child is fully aware this is of a sexual nature. 
any sexual actions or acts between si siblings. Now, we're not talking about non-sexual, normal affection of older siblings to younger ones. For this, we both say everyone has to use your judgment. You cannot say that an older sibling is playing with a younger three-year-old sibling and gives them a hug and a kiss. This is as normal as normal can be. But you have to use common sense. You have to be aware, and if you're aware that such a thing can occur where an older child is or who perhaps is already developing towards puberty, or an older child is doing something that seems to you odd, it seems of a sexual fashion, it seems too focused, it seems too intense, kids lying on each other and touching each other in ways that everyone looking at it realizes right away there's something odd about this, then unfortunately there probably is something odd about it, and seek counsel. We have to realize that it's very common that a child be becomes abused and then experiments with their own younger siblings in the home. And people want to say, oh, it's playful. No, it's not playful. And if something bothers you, it's probably because something's going on that's wrong. Seek advice. All these things are aspects of sexual abuse. In C, I've written, the focus of sexual abuse is most often on the damage to sexual development of the child and not necessarily on what exactly happened. Countless times when a shile of sexual abuse comes up, there's a long dean about what happened. Did they touch outside the clothing? Did they touch inside the clothing? They put the hand in the pocket. They put the hand down the shirt. There's a whole dean about exactly what was the miser, what was the action that happened. And that's, that's a fantasy. Let it go. The focus of sexual abuse with our children, unfortunately, is when someone is exploited primarily for the benefit of another person, they're taking advantage of someone sexually for the benefit of the other person, they're clearly engaging in something that is important to them sexually. And the damage is not on the miser. The damage is on the fact that this child, unfortunately, has been brought into the world of sexuality where they simply don't belong and where they can't possibly ever have any possible outlet that will not destroy their neshama, make them feel embarrassed, ashamed, or shut down, or ruin their life. A normal, in normal childhood development, in our machne, children have private parts. So how do we relate to it? So we relate to it through the window, through the prism, through the concepts of sneers and kedusha where children are led and, and taught and understand there's inyoni kedusha, there's inyoni sneers. And so we have to be tsanua, and we're taught in that concept. But ideally, ideally, halavai and halavai, and in, my, in the course of my career, maybe once or twice I've met such a child who was zoicha to come to the chupa without any relationship to their private parts, in the, in the terminology or the context of sexuality. They related to their private parts in the context of sneers, in the context of kedusha. The damage of sexual abuse is, we, we must let go of the idea of trying to done this miser or that miser, or this action, this, he did this or he did that. That's not the issue here. The issue here is was unfortunately a child taken into the world of sexuality where they relate to their own private parts now in a sexual fashion rather than relating to their private parts in a sneers fashion. Because once a child, unfortunately the pathways towards sexuality have been opened up in a child, Rahman al-Islan, there is no possible outlet for that child that will not make him feel ashamed, embarrassed, or like a Rosh Marusha. For many of the children 
who are nichnas, unfortunately, are taking into this world of sexuality prematurely and realize they relate to themselves sexually. Imagine the kind of life they live, the kind of tsar and suffering they have going through life, going through our, our yeshiva systems, our Beis Yaakovs, fully aware and listening to frequently wonderful and well-meaning and completely appropriate droshas about Shmir Senayim, about Shmir Saguf, where good rebeim, well-meaning teachers, pepper and drop into their drushes and their shiurim whenever there's an opportunity to be mechazik in your needs and they exploit the opportunity to be mechazik our children. And Rahman Islan, in that same class, when, when a well-meaning rebbe, and they should, and this is right, and they're mechazik the kids in Kedushis Yisrael, and they're mafred between us and between Umas Ailam that we have in Yoni Kedusha. And imagine what a child feels like sitting in that class, listening to those drushes year after year, who Rahman al has already been opened up to the sugya of seeing themselves, their own private parts, viewing themselves as being part of the sexual community, the world of sexuality where they've been exploited sexually, and now they see themselves as a sexual person. What do you think it feels like sitting in classroom after classroom, year after year, yeshiva after yeshiva, and listening to this, appropriately listening to this? The devastation to our children, the unique devastation to our children, because of the strong, strong hashkofa satayah, the values we have about Kedusha. You have to magnify in your mind what it feels like, the Lebedika Gehinnom of what a child feels like, who unfortunately was already, his pathways or her pathways to sexuality were opened up by being played with sexually. And now they've got to survive somehow. How are they going to get through? What are they going to do? How are they going to live? The issue, Rabbi Isai, is not, the, the dion is not about did he touch here or did he touch there? Was it over the clothing or under the clothing? These are not, they're chalik, but this is not the dion. The dion is, was this child unfortunately exposed to experiencing themselves, their private parts, as sexual instead of belonging to the world of sneers? The damage, the trauma, that happens to these poor children once they view themselves as a sexual being is absolutely staggering. It's staggering. If we can just think that the, the gateways to sexuality are opened up in little children who now view themselves as sexual people without any possibility of feeling connected anymore and to our community, to our Torah, unless they shut it down completely. And the devastation that has later on on their lives is, is absolutely staggering. I, I assure you, and for those in this room who have suffered with this abuse, there are those of us that understand you and understand the pain and the suffering you live with every day because of what happened to you. We have such a chayv kadosh to work on these inyanim to protect our children. I want to mention a couple of statistics, but before I do, I want to talk about the subject of statistics. This whole subject, this whole nicer, is incredibly hard for all of us to be macabre. Anyone sitting here has to have a, I have a hard time talking about it. Kal v'chaimah, if you don't work in this, in this world, if you're not involved in treating and understanding this sugya, how difficult it is to embrace the truth. But if we don't embrace the truth, so what are we doing? I gradually spoke to Rav Asher Weiss Shlita before I came. 
I told him that uh, I understand fully that when we start mentioning statistics, people get unwound. You know, no, it can't be. He's exaggerating. I've heard, you know, from other people, it's nishta zoi. It's not in England like that. But I'll tell you, anywhere I've been in the world, wherever I was, they say, yeah, that's not here. That's over there. Wherever he came from, probably the statistics are there, but not by us. That's our defense mechanism, our boys say. It's part of the defense mechanism. We're trying to protect ourselves. We can't deal with it. I'm telling you, I have a hard time dealing with it. After so many years of working with it, and I still have a hard time dealing with it. I'm asking if you could just be open-minded a little bit. If you could free yourself just a little bit, that we're not talking sensationalism, we're talking, unfortunately, reality. And it's a reality that's hard to bear. But if we don't say the truth, if we don't put the facts down, well, then we're misleading you. Then we're posh up misleading you, and that's not fair. Many years ago, as a therapist, I began and Lakewood over the years now live near Tzisrael. But uh, we began looking at the off the derech world, the kids going off the derech, and began working with that sugya as unfortunately it hit our communities. And as far as I know, there is no Toyodika community in the world that doesn't unfortunately, Rahman Lislan, have an off the derech sugya. What we didn't know early on was the impact of sexual abuse on that sugya. The relationship between off the derech and sexual abuse, that we didn't know. In the early years when I realized what was happening, because it was a major chalik of my, my work, my professional work, I consulted with Gadoilim, should we talk about it? And at that time the feeling was better not. The Oilim wasn't ready to hear. Ruach HaChamim has changed. And the feeling is that the information has to be shared, even though it's incredibly hard to understand. So I'll share one statistic with you. Lite musogim, to try and bring my passion and the passion and pain of the children I work with to you so we can protect our children. I say it not for sensationalism, but both say, please understand. I say it with pain for the hurt children. And it's a misquoted statistic, but let me share it and then let's discuss it. If you look at the off the derech sugya, what's the cause? What causes kids to go off? Amol, since, since the binyan bias, the destruction of the bias, so pogroms and poverty were the stomach of the great reasons people went off the derech. In our world, I don't see kids going off because of pogroms or poverty. But I can tell you the research, those of us that have done it, and I did, I did extensive research in this, and since I did it, other formal agencies have been out there doing similar research and, and reported almost identical statistics to me that appears to suggest that the off the derech sugya alone is accounted for 80%, 80 percent, eight o of the off the derech sugya was fueled by sexual abuse. And it's partial to both if you understand why. It's so partial. Because how on earth does a child survive in our Kahilas, in our Moistus Hatayra, that are trying so strong to be Mechanich our children on Taras HaKodesh, where all our Moistus, we try so hard to help be Mechazik the children on these in Yonim. What does it feel like to listen to that day after day after day when you unfortunately were an abuse victim and actually you feel as if you are that very person that they're claiming in the Moistus that we're stating that's, that's not for us, that's not Kedushas Yisrael, that's for the Goyim, that's not for us. And to hear that rhetoric again and again and again knowing full well that I enjoy it, but I enjoy being sexual. And I have pleasure from it, even though I'm guilty from it, and I feel embarrassed about it, but I enjoy it. And to listen to that rhetoric over and over and over again, 
80 percent. I'm not. I was the first one, I believe, who said it. But I am confident other organizations and agencies have come to the same conclusion. That when you see off the derech, you're looking at trauma victims, and most of it. And even if it's not 80, who cares? The vast majority of the off the derech sugya is caused by this. It's incredibly difficult to stay within our machna, to stay for, even though the kids desperately want it. They desperately want it, Rabbi Say. Oh, but it's very hard to stay in our machne where this has happened to you, where pathways to sexuality were opened up against your will when you were a child, and now you find yourself enjoying the pleasures of sexuality and craving it because you can't turn it off. Once it's on, it can't be turned off. There's no therapeutic treatment that can just cleverly turn it off. The kids come to me and they cry in my office and they cry and cry. Can you not take it from me? Can you, can you, can you give me back the kadusha I had? And the answer is no. No, you can't. You absolutely can't. This is an assign you're going to have to work out how to deal with. Litem Musagim. A boy, unfortunately, Rahman al Islam, is molested pre puberty by an older boy. An older boy plays around with, probably he himself was molested when he was a little boy, and he plays around with the little boy. What's, what's so, people ask me, what's so damaging? Let him forget about it. Tell him it was wrong, it was naughty, he shouldn't have done it. Let him forget about it. How is that sexual abuse, people ask me? What's so abusive? Someone touched him once. Okay, he'll get over it. Normal sexual development in a boy precedes a puberty, at which point a regular, normal, healthy young man will develop Tibus Noshim. And Hainuhach, at the same time, a normal, healthy boy will develop a nauseous ugh, reaction which is given to him by the Rabbi Nishalaylam for taivas anoshim. Otherwise, how's he going to live? How's he going to go through life? As a hainuhach, when a boy goes through, through puberty, a regular healthy boy, he develops a strong taivas noshim and an equally strong disgust, a, pasha, a nauseous reaction to taivas anoshim. That's a healthy person. That's the way the Abishta made it. It's the way it's meant to be. If not, how would they sit in a classroom? How would they be in school? What appears to happen, unfortunately, Rahman al Islam, again, Litem Musagim, Rabbi say, we should have compassion and understanding, and we should understand the noisa, why this is so khashav. Any of the things we've talked about before in the list of what is sexual abuse, any of these things happening, by an older boy to a younger boy, any of these things can, I'm not saying will, but can limit, diminish, or eradicate from that boy developing the nauseous reaction to Tivus Anoshim when he hits puberty. Thus meant he hits puberty develops a regular strong Tivus Noshim and tragically discovers that because the person who molested him was a boy when he was younger and took him into the world of sexuality through male touch, he can have diminished or none, no, resistance to male sexuality. That means he experiences Tivus Anoshim. Not just Taibas Noshim. Rahman al Itzlan. That's the abuse, Rabbi Sai. We're done on the mice that happened as if we're looking at that, was that abusive? And we miss what really happens, which is a fundamental potential shinoi in the Gansa Mahus of the person's relationship towards sexuality. This poor boy, if, I, I can't imagine a worse abuse than that, than to take a poor, nice little kid, a boy, and take from him 
the potential to develop a, a mania, a disgust, a nauseous reaction to male sexuality. Put yourself in his shoes. Just imagine, put yourself in his shoes. What a nightmare, what a Gehinnom this boy's life turns into when he hits puberty. Because this boy's still in yeshiva. This boy's not acted out. This boy, unfortunately, has wiring in his brain connected to his self-esteem that's wiring that's also connected towards sexuality. And that wiring is also connected to male sexuality. And unlike the rest of us, who were not molested ever, who if a man would come and try to engage me sexually, I know I would have, and I've experienced it, a total nauseous, revolting, gut-wrenching, painful, uchy feeling inside, which is what a healthy male should have. That's what the Kaddish Prophet gave us. These kids don't have any of that. They actually get aroused. Opportunistically, they will find, not that they're looking for it, they will experience certain boys and men. Each one is different why and what. Not everyone. Just the same way that all men don't experience arousal from all nashim. However, opportunistically, these, the abuse for a is that these poor little boys will now experience arousal to male sexuality. And they're in yeshiva. And they're in a classroom. And they go on to yeshiva. I get boy after boy sent to me, I'm nervous as now, who come in sabrachan, broken, crushed to the core. They're facing shiduchim. And they come to me full of busha and chlima not knowing how to even say the words, and I know exactly what they're going to say because I see the look on their face. And they sit in silence of pain and embarrassment and fear as they share with me that they don't have Tavis Noshim. How am I going to get married? And I have strong Tavis Anoshim and it's killing me. And it goes back to sexual abuse that happened when they were three, four, five, six, seven years old. When someone played around with them. I'm trying to bring litem sagim. I'm not going to give you the whole sugya of every part and parcel of this sugya. It's not shayev. That's a course. That's a year of study. But litem musagim rabosai. To understand how serious this noise is. And again, it's not about the maisa. It's about the impact on normative sexual development that these poor children are wrecked and they know it and I know for a fact that in this room are sitting people who went through this and are suffering to this day in fact every time I speak afterwards I'm contacted by such people who tell me the first time in their life they felt validated that someone understood the unbelievable Gehinnom of their life of every day of their life to have to deal with this. <coughs> sexual abuse is about the impact on sexual development. Avada, if the abuse itself is coupled with a traumatic event, like, God forbid, like a, a knife point, a rape at knife point or the gun, then there's a double trauma. But we're not talking about that stuff. We're talking about kids playing around and touching each other, opening up the pathways of these children to no longer see themselves in the world of sneers and shmir senayim and our machne, but to see themselves as fully open to and involved in the world of sexuality without any possibility to deal with that other than shame and busha and the potential eventual repetition as they hit puberty. And they need to exploit and do more, so they touch more kids. We years ago spoke, the bottom of the first page, the issue of false resilience. I speak to Rabbanim around the world on this subject. And I ask them, like, what's most of what you do most days? A rav of a kehila in your counseling work with your families. 
and I have no sophic whatsoever that most of what most Rabbonim deal with most days goes back to sexual abuse. The damages to families, the quick marriages and broken marriages and broken engagements. We all know this is a plague that's happening in left, right, and center, that most of that goes back to sexual abuse. One of the ways that some of these young people try desperately to deal with this is by being resilient. In the old days, in the days when I was taught this sugya, many, many years ago, we talked about resilience and why some children are resilient and others aren't. And I spoke this way for many, many years. I abandoned it. I don't do it anymore. I've been criticized many times by people who sat in audiences when I spoke almost glibly about resilience and how some children, what percentage are resilient and somehow they manage just water off a duck's back because they stayed from, they didn't go off the derech. And then people came to speak to me and wrote me scathing emails saying, you're wrong, you're dead wrong. I was one of those, they tell me. I was one of those. And to this day, I'm married 25, 30 years, and I suffer every day. I suffer in my marital relationship every day. I have to force myself and push myself. I have desires that are inappropriate and wrong, and I can't live with myself. How many of these poor children, when they finally find a way to get through, what do they do? They block it out. They shut it down. They shut the sugya down. They become as if it didn't happen. And then they have to get married. I'm frequently, happened to me just last week, frequently I get calls from Kala teachers, from Hassan teachers, who tell me they were giving classes, preparing a finer Hassan and a finer Kala for their Chasna. And they realize, Episva, something's off here. The reaction of the Chasna or Kala is off. Something's off. And I've worked with many, many Chasan Madrichim and Kala teachers over the years to help them ask the questions in the way they get the answers. One of the classic things I hear all the time when I quote the statistics, for example, is that people tell me, I don't know, it doesn't make sense to me. I've asked countless people who look like they're abused, were you ever abused? They said no. Most of them say no. I got news for you. Almost everyone says no the first time. Unless you know how to come back and ask the second question, unless you know how to ask it again in a different way, in a respectful and sensitive way, unless you know how to say to them, would you mind if I described to you abuse? Perhaps you don't know what it is. Perhaps we're talking, it's a language issue here. Do you mind if I describe it to you? I do this weekly with someone, with someone almost every week, who denies vehemently I was ever sexually abused, no one molested me, why does everyone ask me? They're very upset about it. And then as I talk them through it, they get the shock to look on their face as it turns out of course they were sexually abused for years and years and years and they either shut it down they block the memories or they're not misyachist to it it's sexual abuse now we were falling around touching well that wasn't sexual abuse because they don't have a musuk what it is and once i explain to them what it is i watch them faint in front of me when they realize what's happened to their lives and so how many Rabbanim deal with this? Where most of what they're doing with people, families, and marriages goes back to this. And I can imagine you're thinking, the guy sounds crazy. Most of what's being discussed goes back to this? Oh, but yeah. These are the realities we're dealing with. The damages to families, to children. And even if you don't agree with my statistics, and you find it hard to believe... Oh, but the commerce, the commerce of it and the destruction of it, that no one's going to disagree with. That we all know is true. This is why G'day Yisrael have decided that we must speak about these inyanim, these kind of kinusim. It's just crucial because without education and knowledge of what it is and what you should be doing, how will you protect your children? 
Rabbi Rejna had mentioned before in the beginning the taina and complaint. I hear it constantly from families I work with. Sneer sticker, taira dika, kadusha dika families trying to bring up their children, bataras akoidish, who were never educated or told what to look for or what the subject was. They have no clue what is the noisa. What are we talking about? So, how do you protect your children if you don't know? We have in our minds this musag of this dirty old man in the dirty raincoat, whether he's dirty, the raincoat's dirty, or they're both dirty, I'm not really sure. Oh, but this is the musag we have in our minds, and we have no clue this is our children, children touching other children. This is teenagers touching small children. This is in our machna. We're not looking. The, the, the adult pedophile issue is not the nicer tonight. It's a heinous crime. It's not what we're talking about. The subject to Messiah, we're not talking about it. This is an Indian for Rabbanim. We're talking about the sexual abuse that occurs between older children and un younger children that affects homes and every type of home. People say to me, no, it's only this type of home. I don't want to say the words. I'm posh embarrassed to say it. It's posh loshenar to say it. Oh, but they want, everyone wants to say, nein, nicht in unser Stub, you know, in that type of home or this type of home. They come up with names and titles. Again, I, I'm posh embarrassed. I would never even dread to say the words. It's every type of home, Rabbi Sain. It's every type, whether it's Rabbanim and Mechanchim and Balabatim, regular people, working people, it makes no difference. This cuts across everything. You can never reassure yourself, not in my shtub. In my shtub, it's not happening. We have to be chayshed, but not panic. It's like what version said. We're not asking for wild, you know, widespread panic. What we're trying to do is give you information. Zehu. Take the information and use it wisely. Don't panic. Seek consultations if you have a suffix. Oh, but don't panic. We're not after panic. We're after saving kids' lives. Number three. What should a parent be aware of do or not do. I want to mention one thing I didn't write. Oh, you know what? Let me mention it later on. General considerations. Most abusers are not what we picture in our minds as the repulsive, dirty man sitting on a park bench. In fact, most abusers are youths themselves. We have to come to terms with letting go of old fashioned notions of pedophiles, of old, you know, the, the dirty old man sugya in our head. Because Rove Rubam, if I would tell you beyond Rove Rubam, I would suggest to you that 90% plus of all stories about sexual abuse in our Kehillahs, and I'm talking about the Torah Dika world, is not the pedophiles. 90% of it, the damage is done from older children to younger children. So please change your mindset. If you had the mindset, let it go. Every parent has to be responsible and look at our children. Now, you want to know why is it happening today more? It's a good question, not for now. It's a good question. Oh, but it is. Is it more? Is it just Moniscale? I don't know. Let's not sidetrack ourselves with these Lomdisha Shailas. It's a fact that it's happening in our homes and our shuls and our schools and our streets. This is a fact. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't. But get out of your head the idea that this is to do with adult male pedophiles. That is a heinous sugya. It's not the sugya of tonight, Rabbi Sai. That's not this sugya. This sugya is about older children to younger children. Let's walk it through together. First time sexual abuse tends to occur. Now, it's not exclusive of the others. I'm just giving you, again, this is litem musogim. This is not an intensive course that's going to cover all the possibilities of every type of. That's not shaykh, but litem musogim, that we should all wake up and understand. First time sexual abuse tends to occur to boys as soon as they leave the home. 
as soon as they go into any place of formal education, kindergarten, as soon as they're in a place where there are older boys in the school with them, that's when first time sexual abuse of little boys occurs. For this reason, I begged and pleaded with schools worldwide to keep these little kids separate, give them proper shmira, to have cameras everywhere, cameras everywhere, to keep an eye on these little kids. Because little kids are the very easy prey because they have private parts, they have an aver. So they're very easy prey to older kids. Little kids always crave the respect, the covet. For a little kid, it's a covet to have an older kid interested in him, playing with him, talking to him. Even a grade or two difference is a chashivas for a little kid. And so unfortunately, those older children who were already exploited, a large percentage of them will simply repeat the behavior that happened to them by playing with the private parts of little kids. And it happens like nothing. It happens like nothing. In 30 seconds it can happen. It can happen in a bathroom stall in 30 seconds where an older kid shoves a little kid into a bathroom stall while no one's looking and pulls his pants down and plays with his private parts or pulls his own pants down and gets the little kid to play with his private parts. And for that child, the older one, that was visual, tactile pornography. It was stimulus. It was material that he will use to pleasure himself later on. He'll kick that kid out. He wasn't looking to abuse him. As a matter of fact, the older kid has absolutely no musik klal the klal in this world. You'll put him on a polygraph test and you'll ask him. He has no musik. What he did was abusive. Can't relate to the word. He was looking for pleasure material. He was looking for stimulus. He was looking for pornography. And so he touches this young kid's private parts. And the young kid now knows that I'm chashuv. One of the reasons I'm chashuv is because I have private parts. He's created a relationship between self-esteem, chashivas, and private parts. And so the journey of the younger kid continues now, affected, unfortunately, by the connection between his own self-esteem and his private parts. He's chashuv because he has private parts. And so his journey continues. Little boys get affected in, sh in shuls. I've had countless times I begged parents, why do you bring your children if you're not going to keep them next to you? Shul is not a place to babysit kids. It may be convenient and your wife needs to sleep in. I have no idea. Everyone has their own story. But you don't babysit children in shul unless the child sits next to you every single second. And if he needs to go to the bathroom, you escort him there and then you bring him back. Because shuls are notorious for parents bringing their kids to shul and they dray and they play. And they say, they bring them back, come back, you know, come and go, and they're in and out. And it happens like nothing in the bathrooms and in the cloakrooms. Remember, if you can reframe in your mind that sexual abuse occurs when a younger child is now aware, I have chashivas because I have private parts. Someone else needs my private parts or someone needs me to touch his private parts makes me chashuv. That's sexual abuse because of the impact upon sexual development. And it happens like nothing. So no, you don't take your children to a shawl and let them dray. If you bring him to shawl, he davens. And if he's not ready to daven, you don't bring him. Girls typically are abused first time between the age of 9 and 12, typically. None of this is exclusive. It could happen earlier. Please. I'm just giving you the, the classic. But please don't say no. You know, Russell said no girls get abused younger than 9. I never said it. I'm giving litim musogim. 
Girls typically get abused between the age of 9 and 12 the first time, and typically by an older brother between 14 and 18. That is the enfant for most girls of their sexual abuse. People have a hard time relating that this happens between a brother and a sister. Oh, but it does. And tragically, tragically, in countless of these stories, by the time the girl gets older, three, four years later, gets older and hits puberty, and her life falls apart because she sees herself as a sexual being, and so there's only one of two ways to deal with it. You shut yourself down or you act out. You either act out, not because you're a prude, so chas v'shalom. It's disgusting. She acts out like a prudza because she's trying to survive. She's trying to deal with and live with the fact that someone sexualized her and she can't live with it. So one option is to shut it down, which many of them do. And then they get married with this false resilience and they can't deal with intimacy and the marriage explodes. The others act out sexually when they hit puberty. And so now this 9, 10 year old girl hits 13, 14, 15 and acts out sexually while her brother who abused her has somehow by some miracle put his life together somehow. He's off learning in Eretz Yisrael somehow. He may have got married somehow. And her life is a Gehinnom, a nightmare of torture. She's been sexualized, and he's the big tzaddik of the family now. He's the hero. He put his life together. He went through his struggles. Boys will be boys. Oh, but he went back, and someone was makar of him, and now he's learning shtak. And she's dealing with the fact that she goes to school every day, and she's the prutza. Because the only way she can deal with what happened to her, the only possible way she deals with it, is by actually enjoying it. So she acts out sexually, and she's condemned, blamed, criticized. She's the one that's thrown out of school, thrown out of the communities. She's the one who's looked at as she's the Rishanta. And all she's doing is reacting to what happened to her. That's the typical unfang is in, in homes. The girl sexual abuse typically happens first time at home. And it's almost always an older brother. Could be a young uncle. Could be other people. Lots of stories. Oh, but the typical, most common, classic story is an older brother with a younger sister. And Rabbi Sai, I'm talking about children who do full sexual acts together. We're not talking simply just about touching each other. But that alone could cause the impact of trauma. The fact a girl knows her brother needs her this way creates all the trauma and can send her off the derech and into a crisis of pekuch nefesh. And it is pekuch nefesh. Don't, don't, this is not a foolish statistic. It is real pekuch nefesh. Kids who typically abuse victims who will turn to drugs not because they thought drugs were clever, not because they did some research and decided drugs, that's cool. Let me be like a guy and do drugs. Let me do drugs. That wasn't why they did drugs. They turn to drugs by accident. They fall into the sugi of drugs by accident. Someone gives them something and they're hurting geferlich. We can't imagine, those of us not abused, what it feels like to be an abused child in our killers. And so one day, opportunistically, by accident, someone gives them a drug. They give them a pill, a simple pill. They find it, they take it. And guess what? They feel better. They don't feel so much hurt and pain and fear. They can breathe better. And so starts their journey into drugs. No one chooses drugs because they think it's smart. Therefore, from age nine, no boy should sleep in a room with a sister. It's absolutely unkind and unfair to put a nine-year-old plus boy asleep in a room with a sister. Once a boy could possibly be reaching towards puberty, 
Once he could be having his first hehurim, and I'm being machmi here, because I've seen nine-year-olds who've reached puberty today. I've seen nine-year-olds with bagras where they've already developed. So nine. This poor kid, how many kids told me of the torture it was for them, sleeping in a room with a little sister, talking about little sister, when they hit puberty. And they knew in that bed, in the middle of the night, they got up to the bathroom and they started getting a kishri. And there's that little girl asleep. And it would be so interesting to look what it looks like if I could pull down her underpants and take a look. And Kachava so starts the journey, Nebuch, of sexual abuse, the, the, another cycle. And this poor boy wasn't abused. He was simply a boy reaching Bagras, placed into a room unwittingly, together with a younger sister. Boys of nine years old and up do not belong sleeping for any reason ever in a room with a younger sister. And, and then people say to me, what happens if there's two sisters in the room? Well, then you've got double the problem. It's Meshuggah Rabbi, so you've got to realize this poor little boy is in that room at 4 a.m. when he wakes up with a little bit of a kishri from a chaloim he had, and he sees one of his sisters with the covers off and the light from the street light on her, her body, what did we do to him? What nisoyen do we place him in? How can we do it? No boy over nine sleeps in a room with a sister, period, finished. If that presents a problem in your house, work it out. But don't cut corners, Rabbi say. It doesn't happen anymore. A father should never sleep in bed with a child. I've had numbers of the most painful, pitiful, tragic stories of sexual abuse that as I dealt with older children, and we reviewed and went backwards. They couldn't recall. They, don't, they were never molested. Nothing ever happened to them. The regular kinderlach. And they couldn't understand how did they become sexualized. They just, I always felt this way, they said. And if I'm persistent, you know, and keep working and trying and, and seeing what we can evoke and what we could bring up. And slowly but surely I found a pattern and it's such a painful, painful, and such a chmonis, which is why I'm saying it now. Because there's no intent to do anything wrong. Adarabba. There's a father who hears his babies, his children wake up early in the morning, and it's way before time to get up. And he figures, they're crying, I'll take them into bed with me, I'll comfort my child. Which is okay. I have no problem with that. Unless there's a svek sveka, he's going to fall asleep. If you have a svex faker, you might fall asleep. You do not take a child into bed with you. Let the mother take the child into bed, not a man. And as painful as it is for me to share it, I share it, and, and it's not comfortable. Oh, but I heard the stories too many times of a father who woke up, having done this, to discover his child playing with his exposed aver as he was having a chaloim, because he fell asleep with a child who somehow the contact must have touched somehow his aver that became bakishri to find a child playing with his aver. A child, totally a little baby, has no clue what they're doing. And we've discovered that this kind of thing causes sexual abuse. Fathers, do not take children into bed with them if you have a svek sveka of falling asleep. If you're awake, you're up, you're schmoozing, and it's comfort and it's cute, by all means. Oh, but not if you have a sophic, the slightest possible sophic, you might fall asleep. Don't do it. Two children of any gender should not be in a room with the door locked without the parents understanding in advance why. I got countless stories, tragic stories, and they were like pitiful in a sense. Started off with girls, Shabbos afternoon, 
daughter has a friend who's going to come over and they're going to study Nach. They're going to prepare their homework. They're going to study. And the parents go to sleep and the two girls go into a room and they lock the door. Why do they lock the door? They lock the door officially because we don't want to be disturbed by the little kids. We're studying and they're disturbing us. And two hours later, they come out of the room, having studied for two hours. They've told it to me countless times, girls, how that was their time to experiment sexually. One of them had been abused. One had been abused, terrified to have access to boys, because that would be seen and that would be chapt. She experiments with a friend. And Pasha Kal a girl and a boy in a room locked. And even two boys in a room locked. A locked door in a bedroom or any room with two kids together. Without the parents knowing in advance why. And you need to tell your kids this. I don't ever want to find you locked in a room with another child ever. Without clearing it with me first. And there may be a reason why. Kids could be changing. You know, two kids share a bedroom. And they're changing at night. And they like to lock the door because the kids come in. And it's a 30 second mice, a minute mice while they lock the door. It makes perfect sense. Lock the door. You don't want the kids, you know, coming in while they're changing for bed. I'm saying use common sense. But two children of any gender, two boys, two girls, a boy and a girl, in a room together without any explanation of why, locked in a room for a period of time, something is happening in that room. And you have to be kids, this is not acceptable, ever, ever. Girls experiment. If you have daughters, you have to realize, just like boys experiment, girls experiment. In our kahillas, when kids have been sexually abused, so the lines have been crossed, the pathways to sexuality have been opened up. And these kids, you know, they have nowhere to go with it other than play with other kids. Teach your children that if someone comes to them and someone tries to touch them or engage them sexually, you have to have a conversation with your children. It sounds something like this. You sit with your children and you say to them, listen, and, and I want to tell you, I've heard this from G'day Yisrael, it's muta l'shanas a little bit. We can say a little white lie here. I don't like the idea of sitting a father sitting down with their kid as if the father's choshed their child, you know, angrily choshed their child. This is a very dangerous and damaging thing to do to the yachas between a father and child. And I heard from G'day Yisrael time and time again, muta, it's muta to be mishanas, and this is the way. You tell your children, my father, Zayda, talked to me. I imagine his father talked to him. So I'm going to talk to you. It's a Messiah. You make it a Messiah. It's not personalized. It's not like I'm choshed you. You understand? It's a Messiah. It's a Messiah. And just as I was told, I'm passing it on to you. That there exist in the world some children and the stomach or adults, children or adults, you'll probably never meet them. Chances are you'll go through life and never bump into such a person. And I didn't. You could tell them I never bumped into such a person to reassure them. I never bumped into a person. Mommy never bumped into such a person. But I know they're out there. And they, may, they, they exist. And you may bump into such a person. And these people like to touch children in their private parts, or they like to encourage children to touch the adult or the older person, to touch them in their private parts. And again, I reassure you, it probably never happened. I never met such a person in my life. Never saw it. And the stomach, it'll never happen to you. Oh, but just like my father told me and his father told him, it's my here to tell you, and you should tell your children this from the moment when they leave home, five years old, as soon as they go out to formal anywhere where they could be touched by older children, and you tell them that if it ever happens that someone comes over to you, and again, I'm telling you, it'll probably never happen. 
You'll probably never meet such a person in your whole life. I never met such a person. Keep reassuring them. But should you ever meet such a person, the first thing you say is no. And don't just say no, say not today. Maybe tomorrow. Because this way the person doesn't pressure them. If you give a little bit past Pasalo to the, uh, you understand, the person who's trying to touch them, they don't pressure them. So you say not today, maybe tomorrow. Ask me tomorrow. First you say no. Then you go. You leave the scene and you tell me, mommy, or the principal of the school. Whoever the, your prince, school principal is, you go to the principal of the school and you tell them what happened. No, go and tell. And you reassure them, you'll probably never meet such a person. We don't want our kids walking around terrified that in every corner is such a person. That's absurd. Oh, but we have to arm them with information and put it in the Gedder of Masaira. It was told to me, I'm passing it on to you. And again, I never met such a person. And Bistomi, you'll never meet such a person. Abeluyatsu, you'll meet someone who wants to touch on your private parts, which means the parts of your body that are covered when you go swimming. Even when you go swimming, the parts of your body that are covered when you go swimming, someone wants to touch you on those parts or get you to touch them, you say, no, maybe tomorrow. Come back and ask me tomorrow. You go and you tell. We all have a chiyav to tell this to our children. In my opinion... Anyone, father, mother, who does not say this to their children when they leave home will be marshal their children. It's simply wrong. You have to give your children the information. And again, that doesn't guarantee it's not going to happen. I have plenty of people who told it to their children and it happened anyway. Oh, but let's give them some information. Let's give them the Messiah. Let's give them the chance. Tell them, Rabbi Say. Everyone has to speak to your kids. And when you speak to your kids... A chazara at least once a year every year when they start school. If they go to camp, chazara. Every time, they, if they go to a sleepover, which a b'chlal is a makam sakana in my humble opinion. Sleepover is a pasha makam sakana. Unless it's like a really yotam in a klal, you go to a chasna out of town and you send to your shvaga, and even then, it's a makam sakana. You should know sleepovers is a makam sakana. Most of the stories we hear of early childhood sexual abuse relate to sleepovers. It's a makam sakana. Tell your kids, though, every time. Once a year, the kolapachas from five years old and up. Tell them when they go to camp. Tell them when they go to sleepover. Tell them. Don't be embarrassed to tell them. But don't make it frightening. Don't scare your kids. You tell them it's but Messiah. My father told me. I never met someone. Baruch Hashem. Ech oh, But it's you do. Such, such people exist. And I'm just giving you information. Pasha, give it. Be relaxed about it. Don't be scared. Don't look frightened. And if you really, really, really can't do it, make sure someone else does. But I really implore you, every father should say this over to their children gently, respectfully, relaxed. Relaxed, Rabbi Sai, and loving, and put it in a ghetto of Messiah. Don't make it scary. We don't frighten the kids. And make sure you point out, I never met such a person. In fact, I don't even know someone who did. Obviously, but it's a fact. It happens sometimes. And therefore it's my chiv to tell you. Most parents, I won't do a show of hands. I've done it in the past and had an honest show of hands. Most parents admit they've never done this. They've posh it, never done it. So I implore you, Rabosai, everyone, do it. It's a simple little conversation. It doesn't scare the kids at all. By the way, I'll tell you something else that's interesting. When you do this conversation, and you do it with your kids all the way through school, do it all the way up until Bar Mitzvah, you can do it all the way through. Do it when they go off to yeshiva. Have the conversation again and tell them, you know, in yeshivas, there are kids who, who want to do these things. I'm just being ma'ira you. What to do in case it happens? You can always tell me. We should tell our kids about it. Again, without pachad, without panic. Just talk to them about it. And I can tell you, 
what you will discover is they're already aware and stories have already happened to your children. You will see will emerge. The bonim and the therapist will have to deal with this because what's going to happen once you all go home and talk to your kids gently is what you're going to discover is many of them have already had the experience. Do not panic. Do not panic. Seek help. Do not panic. Do not investigate. We'll come to that a little later. Just talk to them. But I want to say it very clearly. If they tell you something has happened, don't panic. I'm going to talk to you shortly about what you should do. But, but often clearly, what you're not going to do is become Scotland Yard investigating and being hiker, you know, and, and, and trying to like, put them on a lie detector test and try and force information out of them. That's not what you're going to do. Don't panic. Thank them for sharing the information with you. If you're not sure what to do, and I'm going to explain shortly what you should do, then seek advice. Don't do anything. It's better to do nothing. You can always come back tomorrow and talk to them about it. If you're not sure, don't. Just don't talk. Just thank them and give them a hug and say, I'm proud of your bravery for sharing that with me. Don't do anything else till you know what to do. I want to be very clear. Look at the last piece, number eight, on this first page, second page. The secondary, more devastating trauma the children and later as adults have as a result of sexual abuse is they feel they cannot tell anyone or if they do tell someone, that their reports will be discounted. One of the greatest problems we've seen, and I've witnessed and treat in treatment, this is the trickiest problem in treatment, where a child reveals that someone played with them and touched them. And guess what? Much worse, the damage and trauma to the child of not being believed or being questioned and someone's going to analyze and wants to know and they look upset with them for, for, for getting someone else in trouble, that trauma, Rabbi Sai, is usually worse than the actual sexual trauma that occurred in the first place. When someone they love, they should be able to respect, they look up to, who should protect them, starts doubting them and questioning them. The trauma and betrayal of that experience is worse very often than the actual sexual trauma that occurred in the first place. And it's painful because it's often someone you know. With girls, it's very often someone, an older brother, a young uncle. Someone in the family system who's choshev. I've had grandfathers who've done it with their granddaughters. And the grandfather's a chosh of a yid. And someone has rachmanus on him and the whole family system. Meanwhile, this poor little girl is devastated for life. Or poor little boy is devastated for life. The secondary trauma of not believing a victim is usually worse than the primary trauma of what happened to them in the first place. So if you go have this conversation. And you have the conversation with your child, what to do if it happens. No, go and tell. And it, they reveal that something happened, and they tell you who it is, and you can't handle it. Rabbi Sai, handle it. You have to handle it. Because if you don't, what you may be doing at that moment by doubting and questioning by telling a child, you shouldn't talk that way, it's not sneerstick. You can't speak that way, you'll bring shame. Shame, it'll be a shanda to the mishpacha. You know what you're going to do to us if you report, if you tell anyone? The damage of that is worse, usually. Worse in terms of their tragic lives, the devastation of their lives, than what happened in the first place. So please be sensitive. If you go home tonight... Or tomorrow, it's too late tonight. But when you speak to your kids, you should make a Kabbalah, everyone here, that before Shabbos, you're going to talk to your kids. Don't go home. Yeah, I'll get to it. Before this Shabbos, everyone's going to talk to their kids. You're going to say the go, no, go and tell. But I'm cautioning you that if your child, which is going to happen to some of you, it's a fact, 
Some of you will have this conversation before this Shabbos and your children will tell you about things that have already happened when they see that they're safe to talk to you. Please don't doubt them. Don't question them. Don't ask for details. Seek advice. Seek counsel how you should talk to them. Praise them for their honesty in telling you. Zehu. Don't do anything else. Not till you've sought advice and counsel about what to do. Praise them. If little kids, incidentally, little children, ever start talking spontaneously, you know, sometimes little kids, they start babbling, then tape it. Tape it. Just put your phone on record and just leave it there and just listen to them and don't ask, just listen. Tape it, because Masih Lefi Tumo, the truth comes out. There's another thing here, there should be number nine. You can write it if you want. I forgot to put it in. But the last one on this page should be number nine. I think yours is number eight, am I right? <clears throat> and number nine at the bottom of this page should be babysitting. I want to tell you a painful heora about babysitting. Two very painful heoras about babysitting. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we all need babysitters. Everyone's got simchas, a running, a head, and a hair, and we all need babysitters. I'm going to tell you two painful heoras to be aware of, be ma'ayra, the tzibba, because it's information you have to have. Firstly, it's common that kids who were abused and hurt struggle, they're not so in school anymore. They may be out of school, they're more available, they're not so involved at night time. Sweet kids, nice kids, struggling. And they're more available for babysitters. Painfully, 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 over the years of the work, I discovered that a whole chalik, two phenomena I put together anecdotally. One phenomena was little kids, especially little boys, who told me they always felt they never had any memory of any sort whatsoever of being molested, being sexually abused, none, zero. And I believe them, I believe them. It was clear they were telling the truth. They weren't angry, they were just reporting, none. And yet they did know that from an extremely early age in life, they've always been playing with their private parts obsessively since they're three, since they're three years old two, three years old, they know they've always been playing with themselves and no clue why. How I discovered this is not relevant. But once I discovered it, I did some research into it and discovered how prevalent it was and I was absolutely stunned how prevalent it was for struggling, abused boys and girls babysitters, especially the girl babysitters who'd been abused themselves to use the private parts of children they were babysitting to pleasure themselves with. They had physical, visual stimulus in the home with no one around, and they would exploit the private parts of little kids they were babysitting. They discovered changing, as one girl told me, she discovered that little boys, when they change the diapers, sometimes they have a little kishri. And that led them to being sexualized. And they played with these little boys and girls. Early on, I did research on it. It was very difficult to do. But calling the parents and trying to work out who the babysitters were of these little boys, especially, who grew up always pleasuring themselves, touching themselves from age long, long before puberty. And then we put the dots together. After I connected the dots, I began almost routinely when I interview kids asking them if they've ever done this too and was absolutely shocked to discover how prevalent it is. If you have a babysitter or your chayshet is a struggling kid themselves, take two. I've never heard of it happening with two. Take two kids, don't take one. If you have a half a minute, the kid you're using for babysitting is themselves a struggling kid who could be a victim. Take two of them. It costs more, but take two. 
Don't take one, it's too dangerous. Secondly, and this is hard for just to come to terms with, but again, I've had too many stories. And, and is one story enough? I don't know. Maybe one story is enough. Of babysitters who themselves were victims of abuse by people coming home in the homes that they babysit at. This is a fact here in Stadt. The Machanchim have told me about it. I know it's a fact elsewhere in the world where kids, little kids, they're nine, ten years old, little girls are sent babysitting, unaware the older brothers come home from yeshiva because they know there's a babysitter and they get these girls and compromise them. I've even had stories with fathers. I do not want to panic the island, please. And I'm scared to even say this to you. Of a be aware, in my opinion, there is such a 100% confident home. When you send your daughter to babysit, you can have 100% confidence nothing's going to happen to that child. We have to believe that, Rabbi Isai, or we're really doomed. We just simply have to believe it. And I do believe it. 100% I believe there are homes that I could have confidence. Yeah, nothing's going to happen to this kid. But can I say this much to you? That unless you share that confidence, don't send your kid to babysit there until you have such confidence. If you have a sophic, if you have any doubt, don't send your kid babysitting. You need 100% confidence in your heart. Ask yourself the question. If I found out that something happened to my daughter babysitting in, or my son in this home, would I be shocked? Ask the question before you let your kid go babysitting. If you don't know the home yet, get to know the home. I'm sure they're nice people. But get to know them, please. And unless you're 100% confident, don't send your kid babysitting. Prevention, page four. This we're going to run through. Children with one or more of these following attributes have an increased risk of being abused. These, I'm giving you five ideas here. Children with poor social skills, non-athletic, or with sweet, timid nature because they need and crave the attention and affection and they're vulnerable to older kids showing them affection or attention. They desperately need it, and they can be exploited very easily. Children with few friends, same idea. Children who crave attention of older children or adults. Children who are very secretive. And children who feel they are often not believed by adults, similar to the secretive. These, these are kids, especially you have to, if you have kids like this, you need to know where they are, when they are. You need to be on top of the situation. These are kids who are particularly vulnerable. Now, some basic tips on how to teach your children to be safe. First of all, there are a couple of books, from books, nice books, about good touch, bad touch, that are not, they won't sexualize your children. They're written by from people. I mentioned one here, published by Masoira, Art Scroll Masoira, uh, called Let's Stay Safe. It's an excellent book, and it should be read together. So it's, it's a lovely, and it's not a book that's going to sexualize your child. In all our machnas, every one of us, we're all safe using this book. You should read the book with your child, or your wife should read the book with your child. Probably your wife should. I think mothers seem to do a better job of this than men do for some reason. But by all means, if you feel safe doing it, do it. Read a book with your kids about staying safe, about what's good touch, bad touch. It should become something understood in your home that there's something as good touch and there's bad touch. There's safe touch, let's, and let's talk about it. Let's get the book and let's read it with the kids. Not obsessively, but let's read it. Once a year you can review it together with your kids again. Use it, have the book around. Let it be in the culture of the home as one of the books on the shelf. It's not explicit, Rabbi Say. There's nothing bad in the book. Let the kids talk about it. It may open them up. It'll, it'll safeguard them. It'll help safeguard them. 
If your child often seeks close relationships with adults, find him a mentor. A lot of these out of sync kids, they're just not with the program, like I said, not so athletic, they're not so good in learning. They seek attention. They want the attention, they crave it from older adults. They can easily be exploited. Get them an older adult. Get them a healthy mentor. Get a, a Rebbe to learn with him who's going to be a mentor. It's not about the learning, it's about the relationship. Get someone, provide someone for him so he doesn't have to go seek it himself. Ensure that your children know they can inform you <clears throat> if something or someone makes them feel uncomfortable. Watch your reaction. There's a phenomena that happens with very little children. It does not happen with older children, nor does it happen with teenagers. But it happens with very little children called false memory syndrome. I want to mention it. A little child, you can go home from a kinos like tonight. My goal, and Regina said it clearly, is not to scare or terrify. It's to inform. If, Grada, if I've scared and terrified you, please tell me afterwards I, I did it. It's not my intention. It's my intention to give you information. If a child reports and tells you and you feel that something's happened, watch your reaction. And I want to tell you why. Because you can ask a little child, a two or three year old, this only occurs with very little kids, you can ask a little kid, somehow you're reading the book with them about good touch, bad touch, and you say to little Chaim, Chaim, no one ever touched you, right? No one touched you. And you go like this with your head, and he says, no, no, no one touched me, because kids mimic you. And you could say to your kid, if you're chayshed, because you went through this and you heard this evening, and you think maybe something did happen, and you say to your kid, did someone touch you? That's all it takes, Rabbi Sai. That's all it takes. Did someone touch you? And almost any kid, two or three year old, will look at you and go, and the horrendous damage of that moment sometimes takes years. The longest one I had was over a decade and a father being divorced, thrown out the house, until finally what came out was simply the, the, the parent had been in an evening like this where the person didn't explain this phenomena, thought they understood that the father had done something inappropriate, and the mother said, did Tati touch you? It took us 10 years to exonerate this man. Ten year, over 10 years. This only occurs with little kids. If your child tells you something, watch your reaction. Children seek our little kids. They have magical thinking. They seek our approval. So when you start nodding with a little kid, guess what? They start, look, some of you are nodding just now as I'm nodding. It's like the neshama just reacts that way. It's unavoidable. And then you see them nodding and you say, oh, it did happen. And they said, yes. <laughs> the next thing you know, the police are called in and the whole thing. And now the kid has to keep saying yes. Because guess what? There's this whole tarum, this whole matzav happened because he said yes. Watch your reaction. Watch your reaction equally that you don't shut down your kid. Because very often... They will tell you, you may go home and talk to them before Shabbos, and they may tell you a story about someone touching them, and guess what? That someone you love, someone you respect, and they tell you that. Watch your reaction, because equally you can say, no, no, I'm sure that didn't happen. And the kid says, Okay, and so it didn't happen. Little kids, both, I'm talking about little kids. This doesn't happen with adolescents and with teenagers, but it does happen with little, little kids who have magical thinking. Watch your reaction. 
with an older teenager, especially the girl's first time sexual abuse usually happens with someone they know very well, who's probably part of your family or close, close friends. Someone who has access to her. Almost certainly someone in the family. And the shock and revelation tends to make some people have a knee-jerk reaction of denial. No, you can't mean that. I'm sure you misunderstood. And really what we're saying is, I can't deal with it. That's really what we're saying. I can't deal with it. The implication of what you're telling me is so devastating, so I'm sure, it's that, I'm sure you misunderstood. Watch your reaction. Chances are what they're telling you is true. It's sad, but it's true. I want to make a comment at this point about perpetrators. You have to realize what's the subject, the noisev tonight, was not adult male pedophiles who are sociopaths. We're not talking about them. We're not talking about criminal acts of, of pedophilia. We're talking about little kids, older kids, all kids under 20. They're all the first time they do this stuff. They're young. And every one of those, so to speak, Abusers was a victim. It's rare, it does happen, but it's rare that someone just starts doing this unless it, was, it happened to them. It's rare, it does happen. But the vast majority of every one of them, they're victims themselves. And they all need help. They all need help. The victims, the, the abusers, the abusees, everyone, they're all, they're all victims, never. So watch your reaction. Years ago, many years ago, when I was trained, we used to talk about villains and victims. There were villains and there were victims. The one who did it and the one it was done to. Villains and victims. Then we noticed, at least I did, that about a third of the kids in treatment got worse in treatment, not better. And then I thought, why? Because a third of the victims became the villains. So if you miss Yachis to the one who did it as a villain, they lie. Because they're, uh, uh, when you're talking to a victim, um, excuse me, when you're talking to a victim, um, you miss Yachis with a notion of villains and victims, and you're just the victim. It happened to you, it's not your fault. You've got to realize that about one in three of them have already started doing it to other people. So now they'll never tell you and you're traumatizing them. You're actually causing more trauma because you're the victim, you're not the villain. Because Lu Yitsuya, you were the villain, we'd throw you out. Oh, but a third have repeated. Watch your reaction, Rabbi Sai. Get rid of language or concepts or notions of villains and victims. Get rid of it. I think in terms of accountability and responsibility. I talk to the young people in terms of accountability and responsibility. You're not accountable for what happened to you. Das is minishamayim. I don't know why it happened to you. But das is minishamayim. But you are responsible not to repeat it. From this moment, from now that you've entered treatment, now that you've admitted it to me, now that you've acknowledged to me, even if you did it to other kids before, you're not accountable for what, you, what happened to you or what you did as a result of what happened to you until now. Now you're responsible to take responsibility, not to hurt anyone else. Accountability and responsibility is something we, in our world, we can support that. So we don't have to be misyaches to children as villains, as evil. They are victims, even them. And guess what? They're treatable. And they're halishing for treatment. But not if we look at it as villains and victims. And that's how they look at themselves, as the villain. That's why they don't tell us. So we have to make a shina in the language to accountability and responsibility. And even if you did it because it was done to you, for this you're not accountable. You're responsible now to get help, to fix the problem. 
Frequently invite your children to speak to you about anything they would like. You have to create an environment in your home where your children feel safe to talk to you. Encourage them to talk. Kids love talking. Get them talking and schmoozing about anything. If you suspect that something's happened to them, invite them to talk with you. But don't, you shouldn't force them. You need to invite them. Tell them you can talk about anything. They need to understand this is the theme of your home. Your child needs to know they can come to you. They can come and talk to you. Most kids report to me why they didn't go is because they didn't feel safe. They thought their parents were going to blame them. They thought their parents would look at them as bad and they never sought help. Kids, little girls who were abused in bed by an older brother at night in the middle of the night and the first time she was simply too terrified, pushed, too terrified to even cry out. She didn't know what was happening. She was scared out of her wits. She was ashamed and embarrassed. And at the exact same time, Nebuch, there was some excitement. There was some excitement in what was going on too. And she didn't call out. And now she concludes, now she concludes that because I didn't go and tell my parents, that if it ever happens again, I can never tell them. I can never tell them. Because they'll say to me, why didn't you come to me the first time? And guess what? Countless parents tell me that. That's exactly what happened. The kids, years later we find out, and the first words out the parents were, why didn't she come and tell me? She didn't come to tell you because she didn't feel safe. We, parents, have a responsibility to create an environment in our homes where our kids are safe to tell us anything. We must, must work on that environment where they feel safe and secure and we don't get shocked and overreact and shut them down and get scared of them. It's crucial in prevention of abuse that we create such a milieu, such an environment in our homes. If your child comes to talk to you, create an environment to hear the disclosure. First of all, listen. Just listen. Don't ask questions. If they come to talk to you, listen. You could say, tell me more. Don't ask details. The reason you don't ask details is very simple. Because very often children have magical thinking. You ask, did it happen with this one? Did it happen here? Were you there? Were you wearing this? Was he wearing that? You ask questions, kids think that that's the answer that you're looking for. Don't ever ask questions till someone explains to you how to do it. Don't. Please don't do it. Just listen. If you have to ask anything, just ask in a very gentle, non-judgmental way. Is there anything else you would like to share with me? Are there any other stories you would like to share? But don't push them for details. Please, don't ever push them. You can drain them a cup where they never know because they tell you and they answer your questions and they can never know what did happen or didn't happen. Please. Validate them. Make them feel safe. Stay calm. Don't, like, freak out and become crazy. Don't start crying and running, the house, running around the house. Everything calm. Everything ba'adinut. Don't panic. And then seek advice. Ro, I'm telling you, when I'm working with a family that follow these guidelines, all these stories are treatable. We can treat all of this if we get it early enough in life with a supportive family and you get it early enough, it's treatable. <coughs> seek help immediately. The sooner the child is helped, the less likely the impact of the trauma. On the last page, the last two pages, I just want to highlight behaviors that may be associated with sexual abuse. This you could read yourself afterwards. You don't need me to go through it with you, but please, the pieces in bold, please note that the presence of any of these symptoms does not definitively mean that your child was abused. One of the great dangers of evenings like this is you're given a little information and a little information, unfortunately, is too much information because it's not the whole information. So then everyone goes home thinking, I really know the sugya now. 
what we've given you is just a little information to be ma'ayra the sugya, just to be ma'ayra. But please, there's no way on earth you have enough information unless your child tells you directly, definitively. I'm simply giving you guidelines and information. Seek advice and help. If you see behaviors like the ones listed on these pages, seek counsel, but do not conclude it must have happened. Equally, comparably, if you have a suspicion that the child may have been abused, the absence of these symptoms should not be taken as a sign that a mental health consultation is unnecessary. So you don't go through this list and say, oh, they don't have these, so it must be that they're not abused. That's also not true. So the presence of these symptoms doesn't mean they were abused. Am I being clear? The lack of these symptoms doesn't mean that they were not abused. We're giving you guidelines. Zeho, be a chacham. Be a chacham. If you have a, a suffix, a doubt, don't panic. Get a consultation with a mental health professional and work all this through. The ikr of the night, Raboisa is to realize this is real. It truly happens in our homes. We're not just thinking about the, the perpetrator on, the, on the, the, the dirty raincoat and the, you know, the dirty old man. We're talking about our own children doing these things to each other. The results are absolutely devastating to their lives. So let's hope that together, amidst Hashem's all the that we will take keep our children safe.